everybody. I am showing high noon, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome all of you to today's lecture. Thank you for coming. My name is Mike Pitstick, and I'm Associate Director of Annual Giving here at UD, and I'm happy to be with you today. Uh, Encore is a lecture series conducted by the faculty of the University of Dallas in conjunction with the Office of um, Alumni Relations. The lectures are offered to alumni and friends and reframe topics from the core curriculum in fresh perspectives. Today's lecture is co-hosted by Liberal Learning for Life's Studies in Catholic Faith and Culture program, which facil facilitates intellectual formation in the Catholic liberal arts tradition by offering video-based courses taught by UD professors. Today we'll be watching just one of the 20 sessions of the course, The Person, History, and Tradition. You'll first see Dr. Gregory Roper, who will introduce Dr. Wegemer's presentation, followed by Dr. Wegemer himself speaking on Thomas More. And at the end, we'll briefly hear the Cistercian monk, Father Stephen Gregg, who teaches in the English and theology departments here at UD, present a poem by George Herbert. I hope you enjoy it. There is a handout available as well, and you can find the link for that in the chat. After the video, Dr. Michael West, affiliate assistant professor of English, outreach director in the Liberal Learning for Life program, and a UD alumnus will lead a discussion of the video. Without further ado, I think we can go ahead and get started with the video. Many people know the story of St. Thomas More, made popular by Robert Bolt's play that was made into a wonderful film, A Man for All Seasons. More was a lawyer and a talented administrator in the rough and tumble world of Renaissance politics. Good friend of Henry VIII, and his Lord Chancellor, the highest administrator in the whole realm of England. Of course, that all went south when Henry's girlfriend Anne Boleyn became pregnant and he wasn't able to receive an annulment from the Pope because he had a dispensation to marry his first wife. So when Henry chose to solve that problem by breaking off from the Catholic Church and forming the Church of England, Moore and St. John Fisher and three English monks in London were about the only ones to stand alone against this. And they lost their lives, of course, executed for their stance. But what many people don't know is that Thomas More was, at the time, the most learned man in all of Europe. Um, his good friend Erasmus of Rotterdam, probably the only other person who could compete with him for that title, said that Moore was this most learned man, and he's the one who gave him the title, A Man for All Seasons. Moore was a true Renaissance man, learned in literature, he wrote Utopia, in politics, in philosophy, really in the entire Western tradition that we've been studying. But he was also a devoted family man, and he put all of that education, all of that learning, to service with his family. He wanted to raise his family, boys and girls, to have an education that would serve them in the best of times, but also in the hardest times, the times of the greatest suffering. So today, rather than tell the story of Henry and his dispute with Thomas More over Anne Boleyn and the marriage in the Church of England, we have Dr. Jared Wegemer, one of the finest scholars of Thomas More, frankly, in the entire world, to tell us the story of Thomas More, the family man, and how he chose to educate his family. is probably most famous for his death. It became a controversial topic for centuries. Should he have been mocking at his death? Should he have been telling jokes on the scaffold? Uh, you might remember that his most famous line on the scaffold was at the bottom of the stairs. He has been in prison for a year and a half. His health is broken. He can't walk up the stairs of the scaffold by himself. So he says to his jailer, look, if you help me get me up, I'll get myself down. And then when he's on top of the, uh, the uh, platform of execution, he puts his head on the topping block 
he extends his beard and says, don't cut my beard. It wasn't guilty of treason. Now, Henry VIII's historian thought this was completely inappropriate to be so unsolemn at his death. But we'll come back to that. Moore is most famous for his good humor under any circumstance. Humor is very important in the Moore household, and this may very well be uh, a recreation of Henry VIII's visit to Chelsea, because we know that Henry VIII wanted to come to hear his daughters, Moore's daughters, dispute philosophy. Um, and what was the topic of the conversation? Well, from the books, Oedipus, uh, the, the uh, play of Oedipus, the letters of, of Seneca, and the dialogue, uh, which you see on the sideboard, which is the constellation of philosophy, it had to do something with self-government and mastery of the emotions. Moore says that to be a well-governed person, one needs right imagination and remembrance. Now, what does that mean? When something wrong happens or something goes the way you don't want, what immediately comes to mind? What does your memory present to you? What does your imagination present to you? That's a very important element of self-knowledge. Because certain things enter our mind and we don't entertain them. Over years, we can actually cultivate a memory and an imagination that helps us to act the way we know we should act, although we don't feel like that. How did Moore achieve the self-command in order, under any circumstance, to maintain his good humor? I've included some readings to give you a hint of this. One is the letter that he writes to his children, and he writes to his children often, and he asks them to write to him every day that he's not there. They write to him in Latin. And um, this is a letter to all his children, but in it he praises John, the youngest, who may actually have been the least intellectually gifted also. Uh, and he praises John. The letter of my son John pleased me the best, both because it was longer than the others and because he seems to have given it more labor and study. For he puts his matter becomingly and composed in fairly polished language, but he plays with me both pleasantly and cleverly. Now notice he's, he's encouraging this playful encounter with his son and with his daughters and turns my jokes on myself wittily enough. And he does this not only merrily, but with due moderation, showing that he does not forget that he is joking with his father. Well, here again, what a, a charming letter. But most interesting is the way he ends this letter. He says, after actually making quite a series of demands of diligence in the work habits of his children, he ends saying this, there is nothing in itself so insipid that you cannot season it with grace and wit if you give a little thought to it. Moore makes it a cultural priority in his family and in his life, in his whole way of being, to embody what the Renaissance is searching for. That is a full image of a good and happy human being. His first writings, Moore meditates upon the phrase in the gospel that God loves a cheerful giver. And in a couple of the excerpts from his poems, I've given you how often he emphasizes this quality. Now, he translates the word cheerful as glad. And his first book, when written at a time when he's looking to achieve self-mastery, uh, is actually uh, has a section called the 12 rules of spiritual battle 
And one of the rules is think how that we not only should not grudge or complain, but even be glad and joyful of this fight. We should delight to be conformed and like in some behavior to Jesus Christ. A, a later rule of spiritual battle, he concludes this element by saying, a virtue more joy the conscience hath within than outward the body of all his sin. And the archetypal example that Moore uses repeatedly towards the end of his life is the King Saul, the first king of Israel. God creates him taller than others, stronger than others. He chooses him personally. And Saul has all the gifts to be a great king. And yet, he eventually falls from God and turns traitor. And Moore asks, well, what happened? And his conclusion seems to be that Saul begins to complain about the difficulties of his life. And of course, everyone can be in that situation. And Moore points out that what happens to Saul is that he, he first starts to complain. That leads to neglect. And then neglect eventually leads to outright rebellion. Compare uh, that to Moore's end. When he ends his own career, he gives up everything for what his family and friends call a scruple of conscience. And as he is in prison, he's not allowed to have visitors, except uh, the people who interrogate him and his daughter. But he can send letters. And in that letter, he uses a phrase, and with his daughter, he uses a phrase that um, is typical of Moore. He says to her, a man may lose his head and have no harm. Now, that witty phrase, a man may lose his head and have no harm, would be an immensely helpful phrase later on to anyone in his position who uh, understands what's at stake. And one of Moore's greatest trials was his daughter, his brilliant daughter, didn't understand why he was doing what he was doing. And one of the most moving parts of Moore's writings is the dialogue between the two, the third time she comes to convince him to come out of the tower against his conscience. It's a fascinating exchange, and in it, Moore explains the importance of conscience and what it means. There's a voice of God within. And at the end, he says this to her, and this is a, a, a phrase so powerful that it's quoted in the Catholic Catechism under the section on faith. He says to her, nothing can come except what God wills. And I make me very sure that whatever that be, even if nothing has ever appeared so bad, it shall indeed be the best. Notice what he says, I make me very sure. Moore can maintain patience, good humor, because he's determined to fight to do that. He sees the spiritual battle for what it is, and he is a very skilled and learned master of that battle. But to understand Moore as a person and what he tried to teach his children, and his success as a parent and a professional, is to understand how much he fought to be that good and uh, merry person. And the fight was against whims, against fantasies of imagination, but the external results were extraordinary. His bright and cheerful home, his life of integrity, his uh, sought after good judgment, his life as a civic leader who always had time for people. The result of that internal fight was real virtue that was so attractive that he moved those around him to want to be good. In Moore, we see the splendor of uh, life fully lived. And that's what I'd like to have given you a hint of what he did in order to do that. 
it didn't come easy to more, just as it doesn't come easy to anyone. In the tower, his daughter is, tells him of her fear for him, for herself, for her family. Uh, and this is what he says to Margaret. That you fear your own frailty, Margaret, does not displease me. May God give us both the grace to despair of our own self and wholly to depend and hang upon the hope and strength of God. The blessed St. Paul found such a lack of strength in himself that in his own temptation, he was twice obliged to call out to God to take that temptation from him. And yet he did not attain his prayer in the manner that he requested. For God in his high wisdom, seeing that it was, as he himself said, necessary for him to keep him from pride, answered, my grace is sufficient for you. And our Lord said further, virtue is perfected in weakness. The more weak that a person is, the more is the strength of God in his safeguard declared. And so St. Paul said, all is possible in him who strengthens me. In the Tower of London, Moore feared like anyone else. Moore says by temperament, he was always a man of fear. And this is also a very famous phrase that Moore uses. Maybe the most famous line in the Utopia. You must not abandon the ship in the storm because you cannot control the winds. Now that's why this is my favorite sculpture of Moore. Thomas Moore in the rising winds. And you can see the wind blowing on his, uh, on his garments. But he's holding in the front of himself books. He has taught his children and he has himself learned the importance of prayer and contemplation. War began every single day with prayer, study, and going to Mass. He realized that he had many obligations, a weak man, and needed the grace of God. And in the back, he's holding a palm, the sign of martyrdom, but also of victory. And my interest in Thomas More is that he's a person who shows us how to do it and that it can be done. Many people use the necessity argument. Look, it's just necessary. Life is difficult. You just have to do what you have to do. Well, yes, you must not abandon the ship in the storms because you can't control the winds. But the ship, the ship has to be governed by a pilot. And our English word for pilot is governor. Guminari is the Latin word for pilot. Thomas More was made patron of statesmen in the year 2000 by St. John Paul II, a man who had gone through many storms and who knew a statesman when he saw one. And it's the patron of gubernatorum, of pilots. How do we pilot? By the conscience. The letter to Moore's tutor, Yanel, has special importance. And it's one of the most important things that we have of Moore's. Because he writes this when his children are from the ages of 13 to 18, he has to hire tutors from Cambridge and Oxford because his daughters aren't able to go to Cambridge and Oxford. And he has a new tutor, Ganell. And uh, Ganell's just learning his trade. He's very good. Uh, but Moore has been insisting that Ganell not praise his children too much. And in this letter, he seems to be resisting this counsel. And Moore is insisting no, 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 you have to cultivate the right motives in my children. And he's going to explain in this letter what he sees as the end of education. And here's what he says. The whole fruit of their educational endeavors should consist in the testimony of God and a good conscience. Thus, peace and calm will abide in their hearts and they will be disturbed neither by flattery nor by illiterate men who despise learning. Calm, peace of soul, comes from a good conscience. Moore's little poem about the greatest pleasure being a good conscience within. 
He knew that was true, and he lived that throughout his life. And he shows us in his life and works that it can be done to have happy, peaceful children. But it's important that they be taught to learn. That's why family conversations over the dinner table were a regular event in Moore's home. They discussed in a positive way the sermon that they heard uh, after Mass. Uh, Moore wanted to know what they thought. Moore's habitual way of using comic irony, his children write that sometimes we just, most of the time we couldn't tell if Dad was serious or not. Now, why do it that way? He wanted them to think. He wanted to understand what was in their minds and help them understand what was in their minds. Again, this is a master uh, educator, a, a master father, uh, a loving spouse, someone who is a father of his country in the same way that he tried to be a father of his own family. Thank you. So for Thomas More, Education for information's sake was simply not enough. It had to be an education to make one strong, to make one ready to face those most difficult times in one's life, and even to be able to face those difficult times in one's life with spirit, with joy, with a joke, perhaps. So one thing you might discuss today is what sort of education is the best to give our children? What sort of education would be the kind to lead our children on in the most difficult times. It seems to me that a true liberal education can't just be a t an education to provide information, to provide fancy learning, to provide a kind of finishing school so we look good and can say fancy things. But a true liberal education is that which can prepare us for the most difficult things in our life, the most challenging things in our life, raising our own children, facing the death of our parents, facing death ourselves. Okay, it's time for another poem with Father Stephen Gregg. This time he's going to present a poem by George Herbert, an Anglican priest whose life overlapped with Shakespeare's. In fact, uh, he was born when Shakespeare was about 29 years old, and then he lived further into the 17th century. Herbert writes beautiful, well-crafted poems, but in very simple, ordinary language. The complexity of his poems doesn't come from fancy language, but comes from the beautiful way he crafts this ordinary language into profound statements. The poem is called The Hold Fast and takes up one of Herbert's great themes, the way that we are constantly always trying to do something to be active for God when God actually just wants us to sit back and enjoy his grace. The Hold Fast by George Herbert. I threatened to observe the strict decree of my dear God with all my power and might, but I was told by one it could not be, yet I might trust in God to be my light. Then will I trust, said I, in him alone. Nay, even to trust in him was also his. We must confess that nothing is our own then I will confess that he my succor is. But to have not is ours, not to confess that we have not. I stood amazed at this, much troubled, till I heard a friend express that all things were more ours by being his. What Adam had and forfeited for all, Christ keepeth now, who cannot fail or fall. This is a poem by George Herbert, the great Anglican poet-priest of the 17th century. And in the poem, he offers us his own experience of meditation, in which meditation is a dialogue between two voices, one that desires a kind of expression about what it will do to be Christian, and the other that questions those desires and says, what you must do is not claim to be Christian merely, but to truly rely on Christ. And it's a beautiful sonnet,
but also a common experience for us, that we know we want to be doing and speaking as Christians, but we also need to be continually and more deeply relying on Christ so that our words and our actions grow from faith rather than merely being an effort to appear faithful. It's like when someone is trying to join a monastery. It's one thing to enjoy being in a monastery, but another to need to be a monk. Or for example, the venerable Cardinal Francis Xavier Win Van Tuan, Cardinal of Saigon, when he was imprisoned for many years in solitary confinement at the peak of his, of his mature life as a bishop, began to ask God, why did you stick me in prison? There were so many wonderful programs I was engaged in, so many things I was doing as a young bishop in this country. And he heard a voice respond to him, what have you chosen? God or the works of God? This in a way is what George Herbert is leading us to ask as well. In our life of faith, are we truly relying on Christ to whom all belongs? Or are we merely trying to be ourselves?